morning. Great to be together. And uh, it's awesome to be back. Uh, we got back from Oregon last night, so we're back in the uh, not cold weather again. And uh, happy to be here. It does feel like home to be here. Uh, last year we come back and it didn't quite feel that way, but now it does feel like home. We get to be uh, with the family today, so we're excited to be here. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we've been doing a series out of the book of John. And today we're on uh, John chapter 5. And uh, so we're excited to have you here. It's been great to get to get closer to Jesus. Uh, last week we talked about uh, sharing our faith and just everywhere we go, reaching out, whether we want to or we don't, like Jesus at the well. And uh, it was amazing to uh, be able to put that into practice and I appreciated the challenge there. It just gets us going. Hopefully you got to do that this past week. But as we are one and only flight out of Palm Springs Airport, uh, we got grounded for mechanical problems. And we realized when you get grounded in Palm Springs, it's not like there's another flight in a half hour. The next flight was like tomorrow. And so we're all there with our bags and we're like, we got to go now and uh, so basically they took us in a taxi all the way from palm springs to lax cost the airline 170 dollars and we got to share with this guy irshad the whole way over there he was a muslim guy and we from uh pakistan and so we share with him all the way over and you know it's kind of a little bit of broken english but it was just really a powerful time and I appreciated the, the sermon and just kind of pushing me over the edge. You know, sometimes when it's hard, you just kind of go, well, I just think I won't say anything and just kind of hope I get to the airport and just forget about this conversation. But it was really encouraging and we had a great time. And uh, that was the, one of the few times that I've gotten to share with a Muslim here in the States for such a long period of time. And it was really encouraging. I felt inspired. Uh, we met uh, somebody at the Starbucks there in the airport and... You know, it was really just encouraging as a family to be able to reach out, and we just had a lot of fun. Yeah. So hopefully each week you're getting a lot out of this series. And today my question to all of us is, do you want to get well? Yes. yes. And that is the question, and hopefully you'll be able to answer that. And first of all, let's start reading in John, let's say a prayer, and then we'll start reading in John chapter 5. Uh, Father, I thank you for this time to be together, Lord. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son coming down to earth to help us to know you and get to be with you. I pray you be with me the next uh, 20 minutes or so to be able to uh, share your word powerfully, God. I pray you get me out of the way that we can see you. Uh, help us to make decisions that will please you today, God. Help us to see you as well. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In John chapter 5, it says, Sometime later... Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who had been there an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. When I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. You know, it's an amazing confrontation here or encounter with Jesus with the man lying at the, on his mat that he probably was brought there every day just hoping that something good would happen and it's I love where it says Jesus learned that he had been in this condition for a long time you can imagine Jesus walking in and someone who lived in Jerusalem telling him about this place and yeah and there's that one guy right there he's been here for 38 years and Jesus finding out about him and specifically of all the people that were there, he walked up to that guy. You know, sometimes we think that we're seeking after God somehow. And yet Jesus is the one who was seeking after him. And he's the one that approached him and asked him the question, do you want to get well? 
Jesus had a way of asking powerful questions that exposed the heart. And you can see the heart that came out here. Well, I have no one to help me. Well, when the water is stirred, I just can't do it. You know, someone else beats me there when it happens. And you can see all the reasons why he wasn't well. And Jesus, I love it, as if he wasn't even listening to all of the reasons why. He, he didn't go to like the you know, school on how to listen. He didn't go to a counseling class on how to listen. He hears all of his problems and he says, get up, take up your mat and leave. Walk out of here. Wow. That probably wasn't what he was expecting. It was easy. And yet in the, in the man's mind, he had all the reasons why it couldn't happen. So I want to ask you today, do you want to get well? Yes. And when you hear that, do you, do you believe that God can change you in whatever area of life needs to be changed? Amen. I mean, it wasn't like this guy who was laying down on a mat wanted to be able to see better. His sight was just fine. It wasn't like he wanted food. He was alive. He'd been alive for a long time. He wanted to walk. He, Jesus wanted to change the most difficult area in his life. That's why we come to church, isn't it? That's why we come before God, because we want to change big things. We want to be different. We want to be new. We don't want God to just change the little things that we don't really, really need. I pray that today that you will want to get well, even in that area that you've already explained away as I've been talking. All the reasons why you're not going to be able to change that thing. Maybe this guy, he could have gone through a lot of excuses there. That I'm okay. Why would I need to get well if I'm fine? I mean, I'm good. You know, if that's where your heart is today, you will, you will not get well. Imagine him saying that to Jesus. Jesus, what are you talking about? I don't need to change. I'm good. I got life to the full. You know, but he was humble. He was stuck. Even though he had accepted his way of life, he believed that God could change him. Maybe he could have thought to himself that he didn't deserve to change. That this is just how I am. I deserve this. I'm, by my decisions, I've made it to this spot. Even though biblically it's not true that he was, his sin led him to be sick, but a lot of people believed that at the time. That you were in that position because of sin. And so he could have bought into that as well. My challenge for us today is to get, for you, is to get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Faithfully obey what God is telling you to do. Faithfully obey His Word. Get rid of your own opinions and your own understanding and your own thoughts of what's going to help your life. Because Jesus' way will work if you decide to get up, pick up your mat, and walk. That means that we have to decide that we're going to stop feeling sorry for ourselves now. Amen. That we can go through and pour out our hearts to God and at the end of the day, He's going to challenge us again. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. You can get out of this. You can change. It's an amazing thing that happens when we get the faith and we decide, hey, I am going to do whatever God wants me to do. I'm going to stop doing it my way, and I'm going to do it His way. Man. After 38 years, some of us have been stuck a lot longer than that. <coughs> And yet today's the day. Will you get up, pick up your mat, and walk? You know, some people look at this story as symbolic of the Jews. As you read the, some of the commentaries, that they picture this man as Israel. And the five porches on this colonnade as the five books of the law, the Pentateuch. And he was there for 38 years, similar to the way the Jews wandered for 40 in the desert. And the healing waters of baptism symbolized by the waters of the pool. You know, that it's amazing how Jesus raised this man, but that really wasn't 
the entirety of his purpose there. He came to raise him, but he wanted to really talk to everyone else too. I'm sure as he spoke, everyone was thinking, do I want to get well? And that's my challenge for you. Sometimes we can be more comfortable in the misery that we know than in the change that we don't. You might think, well, of course that person addicted to drugs wants to change. Of course they've gone through it so many different times. And yet that's not always the case. You know, of course the person who's addicted to internet pornography wants to change. They've been through that so many times. Of course we want to change our selfishness. We want to change our self-reliance and we want to be humble. And yet, do we really? Because change means we got to step out. And it can be scary. This man had to pay with his life. He had to stand up to the Jews and even at the, ex it could have cost him his own life. You know, here's an example. Really, I'm good. <laughs> this is a very comfortable position here. I've been this way a long time. I really like it here. This grass is so tasty. You know, we get the point. Sometimes it's obvious to everyone around us what we need to change. And yet it still takes a decision and a searching after God on our part to be able to change it. Amen. My hope is that everyone here today will decide, I want to change. Amen. Let's go on in verse 9. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath, and so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. The Lord forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well say, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick, up, pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was. For Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. No idea who Jesus was. All he knew was he was walking. It says, Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day, and so I too am working. So you need to get up if you want to change, and you also need to stop sinning. It wasn't like Jesus said, Man, what a great day. I'm glad you're walking again. That is incredible. I'm sure he was so excited for him, but then there was a serious look in his eye. If you don't stop sinning, you don't know what's, what's going to come of you. And sometimes we want life to be better, but we don't want to stop sinning. We wonder why things continue to go along the same pattern. And yet when you picture this man, it doesn't say what his sins were, but from what he shared, you could tell he was bitter. I've been stuck here for so long and I haven't been able to change. That he was envious. Every time the waters are stirred, I can't get in and someone else beats me there. That he was struggling. I'm sure when other people were healed, he wasn't happy. Because he wanted it to be him. Maybe he was mad at God. We, we see he was a victim of his circumstance because he had all the reasons why he was there. And yet, we can be in the same situation. We wonder why we're not happy. We wonder why we're frustrated. We wonder why our relationships don't work. I just went through Galatians 5.19 and just kind of put the sins into my own words. Sexual immorality impurity, overindulgence, putting things before God, wrong priorities, drug and alcohol abuse, bitterness, hatred, envy, 
jealousy, racism, selfishness, anger, fits of rage. And Paul concludes by saying, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus was talking about. Stop sinning or you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter that you're in the right place. It doesn't matter that you're at church. If, you, if we all don't stop sinning, that can take over our lives. You know, sometimes... I remember the first time I read that passage. For 18 years of my life, up until that point, I thought I was right with God. And I realized at that time, I need to stop sinning. Or not only is my life going to be stuck like it already is, but it's going to be a whole lot worse. That man's life was changed, I believe, as he lived on. He was going to talk about his healing, but he was also going to talk about how he needed to stop sinning. And one thing I want to talk to us as Christians today is Romans chapter 2. Because if you read Romans 1, he goes through all the sins similar to the ones I just read. And sometimes we can feel like, oh, I'm so glad I don't do that anymore. I'm so glad that's my old self. Kind of what Danny was saying. We lose track of the cross in our lives. And let's read Romans 2. It says, You therefore have no excuse who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? You know, I believe to win the world for, for God, we need to be a lot less like this as Christians. That we can be those same Jews that were criticizing Jesus by the way we judge the world around us. And I believe to reach this generation, I can't even remember what they call this generation, but I'll try to find that out. Anybody in the campus know what they call you? Generation D? The millennials. Okay, millennials. There we go. I've heard that before. Okay, millennials. That sociology degree, but it was just like 10 years before now, so I would have known that. The millennials, to reach the millennials, we're going to need to be a lot more humble, a lot more loving, and a lot more respectful of, other, of, of new things. And let me talk about what I mean by that in a minute. You know, it's an amazing time in America. I love this sign. It says, please, God, take down this flag. It is amazing that that flag stayed up as long as it did. I mean, 50 years after civil rights, that flag still was there. Until just recently. That's an amazing thing. I'm so grateful. You know, growing up in the South, I mean, that, that's a huge victory. To see equality coming and just even the, our country acknowledging that. And there's many people that need to change their views. That need to confront the hatred in their own lives. Whether it was against black people, which this flag symbolizes, or maybe it's against Hispanics, or maybe it's against whites, or maybe it's against anybody who's different than you. And yet, we need to become a lot more loving. And I'll share about that in a minute. We've had a lot of interesting discussions recently, and this was one of them. Bruce Jenner and Caitlyn. You know, and it, it does hurt my heart to see where we're going as a society and to learn that so many other countries have gone there first. And yet, that's not really what I want to talk about today. But I want to talk about how much God loves people of all backgrounds. Okay. You know, I chose this picture because I know it would disturb some of you. God loves all people. He loves the sinners, of which we are them. 
Romans 2 says, You who pass judgment, will you not be found guilty, you who do the same things? Lust, selfishness, drunkenness, immorality. How can we be so different? And yet this past week, we had a really uncomfortable discussion about this topic, about the Supreme Court and legalizing homosexual marriages in the United States. And obviously, I don't agree with that, biblically. But as we had this conversation, it was really disturbing because I found myself not being able to say anything. It was kind of, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything. I said nothing. And what I didn't say was a lot more powerful than even what I would have said. Because it showed me that I need personally to love a lot more. That I need to love God's children, men, women, whatever, whatever they're involved in. That I can't be the one making the jokes. And I don't hang out with the women that much and I think you guys probably are a little bit better, but I hang out with some guys. And we say a lot of stupid things. <laughs> a lot of really unloving things that really keep a lot of people out of the kingdom. If we're going to be the church that God wants us to be, this is going to need to be a safe place for every single person in the valley. That I want my heart the next time that conversation to comes up, comes up to believe and feel God loves all people. And I've been praying about that and it's getting there. But be praying for me as I'll be praying for us as a church. Let's let our, our lives shine, our marriages shine, our families shine. But I know we don't have a lot of people that live in Palm Springs. If we went through the, the roster of the church, most of the church is over here and not over there. And I wouldn't say it's just because we like it better over here. Every time that Palm Springs comes up, or a lot of times, people talk about some of the sin that's going on over that way and homosexuality being one of them. And I think that if, I think we need to just check our hearts. For me, if I was, Jesus was here asking me, do I want to get well? I want to be more loving. That's how I want to be well. And that's what I'm going after and that's what I'm committing myself to. And I want to challenge all of us to love in a much deeper way, the way that Jesus loved. And think about how Jesus cares about every, the life of every single person. He doesn't judge you just by one sin. He loves your whole self. And that's what God's put on my heart. And I pray that whatever it is on your heart that you want to get well to, that you'll share it with people around you. That you'll radically go after it. Because I believe that this world depends on it. Whether we continue to follow. So that's my speech for the day on that. But I pray that we can be that church. That we can win the whole valley. I want to love people. I, I, I don't want us to sound like the religious right. There's something that... I mean, I agree with some of the principles. But the way that people talk just drives me absolutely crazy. It's so unloving and it's so divisive. And it doesn't win anybody to God. It just pushes them away. It just feeds into what they already think about you. They're already going to think you hate them. And so when you say that, it just checks the box. Yep, not going to church for another 10 years. <coughs> and so I pray that we can be different in this particular way, but in all the other ways. We're so different in so many ways. But we need to continue to grow and be more like Christ. Point number two, and it's shorter. <laughs> Do you want to get well? There's a lot of people out there that want to get well. Jesus is the source. He's set apart more than any person, any religious leader who claims to be God in the flesh on earth. Mohammed just talked about the teachings of Allah. Buddha talked about the principles that we should follow. 
Moses lifted up Yahweh, but Jesus himself said that he was God. And that's what set him apart. He predicted while he was alive that he would raise from the dead, and he did it. This man was talking to the ultimate source for healing in life. And I never thought about John chapter 5 as a chapter where Jesus goes through and basically tells everyone exactly who he is. And it motivates me more and more. The more I think about Jesus, the more I'm inspired to want to get well. The more I'm inspired to want to be humble and follow his way. And I pray that you will be as well. Let's continue reading in verse 18. He says, For this reason they all tried all the more to kill him. Not only because he, he was... Not only was he breaking the Sabbath but, and calling, but he was calling God his own father and making himself equal with God. Jesus gave him this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the father doing because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he does. Yes, he will show him even greater works than these so that you will believe. Jesus says that him and the Father are one. That if you want to love God, that you need to love Jesus. That there's no way around that. He says that so many different times. That his actions are the same as God's actions. He was healing the sick. He was helping the blind to see. He was healing the lame here. And the man was running around. And him saying, God and I do the same things. If you continue reading, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I've highlighted the yellow. He says that Jesus has the power to raise the dead. And that all judgment has been entrusted to the Son. And whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. And you might be thinking, well, you, you said that we're supposed to be more loving. Man, it doesn't sound real loving. Jesus saying that I am the way to be healed. I am the only way to be healed. But he's also backed it up by dying for you. He's also created us. He's also lived a life that no one has ever lived. You know, he goes on. And says, as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And all who are going to their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. That Jesus saying that he will judge the living and the dead, that he has life. He has everything. This was at the beginning of his ministry. Up until this point, it was the year of popularity. And this was kind of the transition when it became the year of opposition. Because Jesus was expressing the truth that people weren't ready to hear. You know, I pray that today that we're ready to hear this. That we're ready to come to Jesus. He claims so many things, and he backed them up with his life. He also went through, because in the, Jew, in the Jews' mind, they were thinking, well, how can you say all this? You're testifying as your own witness. That doesn't work. And so Jesus continued. He says, by myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. If I test about my, testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it so that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. That John was a testimony about Jesus and he's talking now to all the people who rejected Don, John. They rejected his testimony and yet Jesus was not without witnesses. He goes on and he 
claims other witnesses. And I feel like this is important because it wasn't just Jesus speaking on his own. He's saying that his healings and miracles were his qualifications to say what he said. You know, he says that his father himself had testified for him as well. When he was baptized, he said, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And he said the scriptures speak about him. They testify about him. And ultimately, in verse 46, it says, If you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. And why do I say all that? Because Jesus made it very powerful. A very powerful statement. He asked them at first, do they want to get well? And then he said, if you want to get well, you need to come to me. And here are all the reasons why I am the way to be healed. Not only do I raise the dead, not only do I judge the dead, not only did God send me, not only am I equal to God, but if you reject me, you reject God. And not only did I say that, but John said that as well. My miracles testify to that. The Father testified to that. There's hundreds of scriptures that testify to that. And Moses, whom your hopes are based on, testified to that as well. I mean, are you getting a little uncomfortable? <laughs> These guys were put in a box where it was either, I am going to follow Jesus or I am going to hate this man. Because Jesus wanted them to have the truth. He didn't want them to go any other way. To reject Jesus, you need to also reject all of these witnesses that Jesus claimed. You need to reject the scriptures. You need to reject the miracles. You need to reject the words of the Father. You need to reject hundreds of prophecies. You need to reject Moses and the Old Testament. God went through a lot of trouble so that we could get well. And I realize that this last part was a little more heady than preachy. But my question is still the same. Do you want to get well? What are you willing to do to come to Jesus and change your life and faithfully obey Him? Are you willing to get help from people that He's put in your life? Are you willing to say today, I will stop sin in my life. I want to repent. I want to change now. I don't want to do it my way. I want to look to Jesus because He's the one who's qualified. I'm not going to look to myself anymore. And I believe that today can be a life-changing day for, for you, for me, for our entire church as we all decide, God, help me to get well. Amen. Thank you. Going, all right, I'm doing the clothes, I'm listening, I'm writing some notes, and I'm grooving on the message, and I definitely, uh, I'm definitely uh, liking the thought of, of you know, being the guy, that guy at the well, you know, the guy that Jesus comes, has been sitting there for a long time, and you know, we all sit in our yuck for a while, don't we? I know I have. And, uh, and you know, the guy that everybody kind of, you'd think Jesus would just go on by, but he comes because he loves us. But, you know, it's still, it's kind of on us, isn't it? Do you want to get well? So I'm, I'm thinking about that, and that's a really good thought for me. You know, am I going to trust? Am I going to trust Jesus and act? Or am I going to stick with my misery and my smelly diaper? You know, like Dave Ramsey says, I know it's smelly, but it's mine, and it's warm. <laughs> yeah. And that's, uh, you know, that's kind of human nature, isn't it? I don't know about you. But then he goes on the gay marriage thing. And I went, oh no! <laughs> but you know what? I think it's, you know, we gotta talk about this. And I appreciate Scott's courage to come out and just bring it on out. You know, we have got to talk about this topic. And the scary part about talking about gay marriage in front of a couple hundred people is you're gonna make somebody mad. Because not everybody's gonna agree. Um, some people are, you're not gonna be conservative enough. Some people, you're not gonna be liberal enough. I had a very uncomfortable day and night on my family vacation this year as well. 
because the verdict came out on a Thursday. And uh, my brother-in-law, who is extremely, um, let's say, right-wing Christian, homophobic almost, I mean, he wanted to get a gun and start killing people. And then I've got all the kids, and they're all extremely liberal, and it was a very tense and uh, difficult time that day. And I didn't say a whole lot. I was kind of like Scott, because I just, you know, I didn't want to get lumped in with the, the homophobic religious right. But I didn't agree with the liberal, I mean, some of the stuff I heard out of the kids was like very disturbing to me. But you know, I really appreciate the point for me, you guys. And the point that I like Romans 2 because, you know, it says whenever you pass judgment on someone else, whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. And I'm not very good at practicing this point, but I love reminding it and it really keeps me centered. Nobody keeps their own standards. We put all these standards on other people and I don't keep them myself. And it doesn't mean there isn't a right and wrong, because there absolutely is. Um, I think some churches want to make homosexuality acceptable, because that's what's going to make the most people happy in the world. Other churches want to make it, on the other extreme, the sin. I got news for you. Homosexuality is not the sin. It is a sin. And we will all be separated, God, not because we're homosexuals or drug addicts or bitter, but because we're proud and arrogant and we don't want to surrender and we don't want to do things God's ways. And I think it's really good because it helps me a little bit. You know, one of the things, it's funny, Nikki and I listened to a little podcast this morning on the way home uh, for our quiet time, and the guy was talking about the difference between acceptance and approval. You know, I can accept people without approving of their lifestyle choices. And if you just want to think about that, what about your kids? I completely accept my children. I don't approve of every choice they make. And we can unconditionally love and accept people without meaning we condone their choices in life. And that makes it easier for me to deal with this issue. So that, there's, there's my thoughts on it. Thank you for bringing it up, bringing it out today. Thanks for a great lesson. Thanks for truth. You know, Scott definitely gave us truth. We need truth. Jesus told that guy. Uh, he didn't even listen to the excuses. Get up. We need truth, huh, guys? Let's pray and close out. Father, thank you so much um, for the way you move in our lives. Thank you, God, that you come to us. We're that guy. We're that girl laying there that everybody else goes ahead of. But you come to us, God. And uh, you move. You draw near. And we feel that stirring in our heart, God, to get up. Maybe I should do it. God, you're, you're just calling us to get up and change our lives. And I just really am grateful for your word, the way it really does not leave us on the fence. We're going to go one way or the other. And thank you for a courageous preaching today. I pray, God, for each one of us that we would talk about this today when we leave, that we would pray about it when we leave, and that we would act. Most importantly, we would act upon it. Thank you for this amazing body of believers I get to be part of. Bless our day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.